I think it's BS. I think it's all BS. I think the whole book is BS. And this is why. Hey, what's going on, y'all? This is the Restaurant Breakdown with Alberto Gonzalez. It's great to be back. It's almost been a year since I've made uh, an episode. But I'm back. It's been a long year. And I'll tell you what, 2020 and 2021 both have knocked me around pretty good. But I'm, I'm glad to be back uh, behind the screen and being able to analyze the economy and restaurants with you guys. So actually what I want to talk about today is I want to cover the minimum wage debate. I want to cover the debate on whether minimum wage should be raised, decreased, or it should stay the same. Now, I know hearing that right off the bat, 90% of people want to say, hey, obviously the minimum wage needs to be raised. And I understand that that's a popular perspective. I have no political uh, agenda whatsoever. I'm not trying to push any policy on you guys. And I have nothing that identifies with lenience towards any party in this video. I love talking about the economy and how it impacts myself and yourself. And I do wanna discuss all the different evaluations on the perspective that I have as a small business owner, as someone who's worked in a big business, as someone who has been poor and as someone who does now uh, have more income, you know. And so I do wanna compare all of those aspects before we make, you know, any assumptions of, um, of whether the minimum wage should be raised, decreased, or stayed the same. So in order to understand um, my perspective, you're gonna have to fit into the shoes of someone who works in a small business and someone who works in a big business. So let's talk about small business first. In a small business, you have small funds. A lot of times the business reflects the finances of the owner. So with an owner who has small funds, you often run into maintenance uh, difficulties. You don't necessarily own the fanciest building. So you pay rent on a pre-owned building and it usually has its defects. Uh, understaffed you usually understaffed you don't have the uh, the available resources of a large corporation so you're not constantly marketing on being able to drive traffic to apply to your restaurant uh, therefore the people who apply uh, usually are very apprehensive of the idea of working for a small business now having said that not everyone necessarily understands that you're comparing uh, your personal small business finances to a large corporation finances when they discuss things like daily tasks uh, that they might have to do extra compared to the same industry, just a different corporation with a small with a with a larger funding. Um, so I know that was that was a lot of vague specific. Uh, that wasn't that was very vague. It wasn't very specific. So let's. Let's talk about a specific example. In a restaurant that's owned by a, a, an individual, you run into problems like a server might need a host every once in a while. Um, your staff is smaller, so sometimes even the host or the server might actually be a manager or an owner in some cases. And at the end of the day, maybe there isn't a busser to sweep and mop and it ends up being you know a cook a bartender or a server a host or a manager even and so you get employees who come to you and they're like hey um this isn't what we do at you know texas roadhouse or olive garden or, or, or somewhere with a bigger corporation and you're stuck explaining to them okay 
See, the difference is they have the resources to be able to diversify their employees, give them specific employee responsibilities. And so they're able to have the luxury of just coming in and clocking in and just being a server or just being a host or not having to be picking up where the owner needs extra help. Everything is organized and pre-planned in a, in a large corporation. And so you're coming in and you're doing your job specifically without the ties of having to help out the owner or the manager on, on extra tasks that, that sometimes a corporation takes up in, in, in an office building with marketing and stuff like that because the owner is stuck doing his own marketing and his own advertisement and his own billables and payables and his own payroll and accounts. Um, all of that time that is taken out by the owner doing that is less time being able to train the managers. And so the managers uh, don't necessarily have all the advantages that a manager would have in a large corporation where they're able to go through this system of training. Uh, so I, I hope that gives you guys a, a small idea of, of how I feel small business versus big business picture wise. How does the minimum wage tie in? So you have increasing the minimum wage, decreasing the minimum wage, and staying the same. All three of these decisions are gonna impact the economy differently. So I'm not asking you which one you prefer, I'm asking you how do you believe they will impact the economy differently. So, before we get to the actual answers of all three of those, I wanna talk about income inequality. So income inequality is something that's always been a big deal to me. It's always been a subject that I like to analyze and discuss in all of my life decisions. So let's go over the dry erase board. So we're at the dry erase board. And like I said, I wanna talk about income inequality before we talk about the minimum wage. So here's, here's the, the issue that I run into. In my private life, I feel there are two different upbringings of financial background. Two different backgrounds of financial upbringing. You have individuals who are on the lower and lower middle class and individuals who are on the upper middle and upper class. And in, inside this cliffhanger, this you know, gap, this abyss between these two cliffs, exists the income inequality gap. So the income inequality gap is the ability for someone in the lower and lower middle class to be able to make a leap into the upper middle and upper class. And so here we have a list of qualities that don't necessarily apply to everyone, but in my personal opinion, apply to the people born into lower and lower middle class. And here we have other qualities that usually reflect people who have been born into the upper and upper middle. So on this left side, let's take a look at this. We have a guy with a baseball hat. On this left side, you have the characteristic of being born into debt. So in order to give you a specific life example, I'm gonna use my own life experiences. That way we don't have to dive into any, anyone else's specific life experience. Let's just use myself as an example. As, I, as I'm uh, pretty comfortable with speaking on, on my own life experiences. So on the left side, we have born into debt. And on the right side, we have born into some assets, if not more than one assets. So I myself was born into a family that doesn't necessarily have any assets uh, back in 1994. So that, that includes renting an apartment not owning any vehicles, always either leasing them or uh, 
financing them through a dealership of some sort. Not owning any capital or any property. And not only that, but having to help your parents slash ancestors on any financial uh, needs that they might have. So helping your parents with some money, being born without ownership of any capital, vehicle, or property. On the right side, we have born into some assets. What that means is, for example, my son. He is five months old, but he's gonna be born into some assets because I myself own a vehicle and I'm in the process of owning property. So my son is gonna be born into some assets and I don't need my five month old son's help to financially stabilize my credit or financially stabilize my bank accounts. So here are two examples, myself and my child's upbringing. Second, has to be employed at all times to live or, um, is handed down property, capital, or vehicle. So what, what that means is living paycheck to paycheck, having to clock in at least anywhere from 50 to 80 hours a week in order to be able to maintain all of the bills. The majority of the time, this is for a big family, uh, Father needs to make extra money, so maybe picks up a second job and is constantly working. And so I found myself in this position for about six years. Six years climbing the ladder of my own restaurant industry. I had to endure working 50 to 80 hours a week. And I constantly would use the phrase, I need to be clocked in every moment of my life. So if you meet workhorses that exist in this uh, area of life, you'll constantly hear them say, I need to be clocked in, or I need to be working more, or I need extra time, or need to be putting overtime. So this is a big characteristic in coming up into this income inequality gap. So we'll come back to this right here. Other people, like I said, my son will most likely have his car paid off and handed down to him by my son, by my me personally. Also some characteristics is they might be born into connections. You know, he'll have certain connections that I've accumulated throughout my life that have helped me financially succeed. Uh, and he'll have experience with money that I personally will teach him in his upbringing in order so that he doesn't have the same struggles that I did growing up uh, of inexperience and no time uh, dedicated to building a financial uh, backing for life, a, ba a financial backbone for life. Uh, different characteristics on the right side, help, him help with building credit. I'll help my son build his credit. Uh, from parents or ancestors, handed down property, capital, or vehicle, born into connections, experience with money, and time available. For example, I had to drop out of college I had to drop out of college because I had to help my parents with their finances. And my son won't have to drop out of college. He'll be able to finish college because I don't personally need his finances, his individual finance to, to help my bills specifically, his parents' bills. Now, most important part right here in the middle, the income inequality gap. So in this income inequality gap, you have business startups, small businesses, and the opportunity of a financial institution to take a chance on you. So you have someone from the, from the left background coming up financially and building their backbone and building their credit and, and most likely has zero capital, zero ownership of any sort. So the financial institution doesn't necessarily want to lend you money because you have no car to put up or, or property to put up as, a, uh, as some sort of lien. 
So that's why it's a gap. Because you have to make this leap of endless sacrifice, leap of endless sacrifice, in order to reach the right side. Okay? So what does this leap of endless sacrifice include? It would include 50 to 80 hours work week. Uh, your, your kids don't necessarily see you as much. You, you're not available to your family, so you can't help them with certain things that a father figure or a mother figure would be able to help their offsprings in. Um, education, any sort of academic uh, need that the children might need that might get skipped because the parent or the mother or father are not available. That is a sacrifice. Another example of a specific sacrifice in my life experience is skipping breakfast. Uh, the difficulty of receiving paycheck to paycheck, paying all your bills, um, but you know, making your own personal sacrifices, not buying any luxury clothes, uh, not eating any luxury food, uh, not driving the car that you want because you can't afford it. Any of those luxuries, not being at the gym because the gym itself is a luxury of time uh, and dedication, that is, those are all fall into the category of sacrifice. And so in this gap, you now, this individual now has to make an incredible amount of sacrifice enormous amount of sacrifice, unthinkable, uncomfortable sacrifice in order to reach this other level. So in, this, in, in my specific situation, I had to give up, you know, time with friends, uh, eating breakfast in the mornings to save a little cash, driving the car that I want, wearing the clothes that I want, uh, spending time doing the things that I want, not being able to the gym and, and, and working on my body figure like I want. All of these different luxuries and even not even luxuries, some necessities like eating breakfast uh, were sacrificed in this leap. Okay, so now that we've covered that, let me grab my marker. And I want to discuss minimum wage. So in minimum, uh, in the conversation and debate of minimum wage, you have business startups right here in the gap. The reason why business startups are in the gap is because you're not going to make any money right off the bat. You're not going to make any money in the small businesses or business startups unless you have specific experience. Experience comes from the right side usually. A specific experience and time that you've dedicated that usually is 0% available on the left side. So you're talking about dedicating 70 hour work weeks and then still putting in 20 extra hours and losing sleep, again, sacrifice, losing sleep, in order to get this startup going, in order to help your small business grow and in order to make yourself credible enough for a financial institution to take a chance on you. So now you add the challenge of not being able to afford employees for startup. Okay, so you've taken the seven seven dollar seven fifty an hour and you've increased it to fourteen dollars an hour. So every, every minimum wage everywhere is $14 an hour now in this scenario. The difficulty now is you have made the gap even bigger. Why is the gap bigger? Because you've increased the difficulty of making this leap of sacrifice as a business startup to be able to establish yourself as a small business to be able to stab yourself establish yourself as a larger business so myself went from dishwasher to cook to server to host to, to bartender eventually to a shift manager assistant manager manager general manager and then eventually a restaurant owner this is me right here in my leap 
of sacrifice. And my leap of sacrifice, if the minimum wage is increased, there is now more difficulty for me to reach the other side because all the employees that I have now want more money. Now I have to rearrange my system that I use to financially make profit in my restaurant. I have to increase the prices. I lose clientele. And not only that, but the larger businesses are promoting this, this uh, fancy new wage that they can hire as, you know, this hiring wage that is a lot larger than what I can provide to somebody on, on a weekly basis for their wages. So all of these employees working in a small business are now leaving to join larger businesses that can afford the larger minimum wage. Now, in the upper and upper middle class, they will be affected slightly. But do you think they're gonna cut the wages, cut their own private wages, or do you think they're gonna just cut the wages of the people in upper middle class? The upper class is not gonna cut their own wages. They'll figure out a way to get that money out. They're just gonna cut the upper middle class's wages until people, st people from right here that used to be upper middle class or middle class, that's why I didn't write middle class anywhere here. That's why I don't talk about middle class because you're in either in the process of moving up or moving back. And these people who had small to medium sized businesses might start falling back to the left side and have to continue and have to go back to making sacrifices in order to reach back to the upper and upper middle class. Um, so let's go back to the desk. That's enough drawing for now. So we, we've discussed quite a bit. Now that we understand how income inequality uh, looks as a visual, let's go back to the, the opinion that we have on this impact for the economy. Raising minimum wage is going to increase the income inequality gap uh, staying the same is not necessarily going to increase the income inequality, ga inequality gap, but it's not necessarily going to lower it. Lowering the minimum wage will affect a lot of lower middle class and lower class people negatively. So, in conclusion, all three have their positive and negative effects. But, I wanted, I wanted to make clear that increasing the minimum wage isn't necessarily help from the upper and upper middle class and the government. That the, it's not the help that it may seem because you become dependent on large corporations. Now, once a large amount of people become dependent on larger corporations, it doesn't help you become smarter at entrepreneurship, which allows the competition to create small businesses. So you no longer have that, that available time to dedicate to entrepreneurship and creating small businesses if you are now dependent and, and learning less at a larger corporation than you would at a small corporation. So in a large corporation, the, like we talked about before, the task list, the job responsibilities is lowered, it's minuscule, it's uh, decreased. Because there's more of y'all, it is more about specifically doing your job than a encompassing this large amount of tasks. 
So what do you lose? You lose experience with the tasks that you're no longer doing. For example, chicken manufacturing company. There is a, a chicken manufacturing company that pays a significant amount more money, more wages than my small humble restaurant. In this chicken company, people will leave, they will join that larger wage to do two different tasks, slice chicken and hang chicken, okay? So, I lose an employee to the chicken, chicken manufacturer. Um, in five years, the employee that stayed with me at a small restaurant may now have the ability to run a restaurant on his own. Uh, it doesn't have to be a restaurant, a lumber company, a small wood shop, a small, you know, paint shop, carpentry, uh, welding, any small business where they were pushed to achieve more variety of tasks now have the experience, these employees now have an incredible more amount of experience compared to the person who went away for five years and dedicated five years of their life to slicing and hanging chicken. So this employee, for whatever reason, uh, decides to leave the chicken plant and come, comes back and gives me a call. And, you know, unfortunately, I have to tell them, hey, the, the promotion that I had, the opening that I had uh, for a larger role, a leadership role, is now filled by someone who spent their time gaining experience and trust from, from the business owner. Whereas you have learned nothing valuable to me in five years. So, whether they knew it or not, they sacrificed experience points for a slightly larger wage. A wage that does not compare to being capable of running your own business and reaching this new category of salary and finance and income. Let's talk about Rich Dad Poor Dad. Very popular topic, very popular on YouTube. I hear it all the time. So I sat down and listened to it. I sat down and listened to it with the time and the availability that I have as someone who made a sacrifice to becoming a business owner. So, Rich Dad Poor Dad, lesson being, hey, Poor Dad teaches you to be an employee somewhere and therefore you, you sacrifice the ability of learning how to be an entrepreneur. This rich dad uses his monopoly skills uh, of real estate and business to duplicate, uh, just triple and, and just overall grows his finances through the, these, you know, strategies. these financial strategies of real estate and business. Okay, so the lesson in this book being, if you learn skills from someone who doesn't understand the big picture, you will not be able to achieve the skills of someone who understands the, the large financial picture. Uh, I think it's BS. I think it's all BS. I think the whole book is BS. And this is why. I came up from working nonstop paycheck to paycheck. I'm not stupid enough to not comprehend that there is a, now a new level of challenges as a business owner. And therefore, I face those challenges and I reach a new category of small business owner and small to medium business owner and face those challenges, and I understand that I have more resources available now that can be used for real estate and, and, and business strategies that may duplicate the money that I have in order to succeed in life. There is no divide 
on whether there is a poor dad or a rich dad. Not for me. There is only the challenges that were presented to me, the card that life dealt me, and how hard I made a sacrifice and hustled and worked hard to dominate those challenges in order to reach the next level of challenges. Now, I do agree that there are certain people who, who spend their whole life dominating the challenges of their own uh, financial category, their social class, and never understand that there is new challenges that need to be tackled as a middle class or upper middle or upper class. I understand. People do People have gotten stuck in those lower challenges and being engulfed and thinking that that's all life has to offer. Saying that those two mentalities can never be the same person, to me, is just some sort of marketing scheme. To It's another YouTube, you know... Uh, propaganda to sell something, sell a book, you know, sell these YouTube views or whatnot, or sell this uh, guru. I, I don't even know his name. I didn't bother to, to look into it. Uh, and that's it. I, I felt like that small conversation encompassed the whole premises of the book, you know, <laughs> and I'm still not convinced. I'm still not convinced that um, that there is a need to contrast those two mentalities in that manner. Um, so I hope that we aren't frustrated with with the the dive the dive into the different effects that. Raising minimum wage, keeping minimum wage the same, and decreasing minimum wage can have on the economy. I do, however, if I can share one opinion outside of analysis, one personal opinion outside of analysis, is not being fooled by, again, propaganda of increasing minimum wage. I I'm not fooled. I don't like uh, the idea of being dependent to anybody, especially large co corporations that are now, as a small business owner myself, they are now my competition. They are the competition of all the small genuine businesses that exist in a, in a locale. All of the larger corporations are out to compete for the same money and finances that my humble small business is working for. So all, all it is, is a more difficult gap for small businesses to now reach the large corporation stage. Again, don't be fooled. Don't buy into all of the, I need a haircut, all of the BS that you see from government and large corporations on, you know, uh, more money being given out to do less responsibilities and tasks that don't require as much experience in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship that can later on be a new tree of life and finances for people who weren't necessarily born into that sort of financial advantage. And that's it. That's it for the Restaurant Breakdown podcast on minimum wage and wages and income inequality gap. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you're listening and tune in. Uh, I'll be able to make a few more podcasts, a few more episodes. Let me finish editing this and uh, hopefully you guys can hear from me again soon. Thank you to all the listeners, always.